Hi everyone, welcome to the Lift and Shift podcast. I'm your host, Giselle Colonzo Douglas, and this is the place where we get to talk to amazing, phenomenal, talented, gifted women who are shifting higher in their career spaces and spheres of influence. But the best thing about them is that they are lifting others as they climb. On today's episode, I'm pleased to have with me Ms. Laura Coupe, who is a defense official currently serving in the Biden-Harris administration. She's also a former Obama presidential appointee. She is a multilingual attorney with domestic and foreign policy expertise in think tanks and the U.S. federal government, including the RAND Corporation, um, the U.S. House of Representatives, the Department of Homeland Security, and the White House. In 2021, Laura was named to the Roots annual list of the most influential African Americans in the fields of arts, community, business, entertainment, media, and politics. I asked Laura to join us for a conversation because I don't really know too many people in this space. Uh, I'm not sure if there are black faces, if there are women in this space that could really, you know, speak to a movement or a growth um, in the area, in the industry. Uh, and I'm not sure how many black women actually occupy the space. So I'm interested to just hear about Laura, her career, her trajectory. And of course, we know that she's lifting others as she is shifting. Um, the other reason why I had you on, Laura, is because when I met you, you didn't lead with your bio or your pedigree, and you're very accomplished. And I'm really just fascinated by people who are able to kind of... Um, reach the highest stratas of success, but they maintain their humility and their humanity. And I think that you epitomize that. So thank you so much for coming to talk to me on the Lift and Shift podcast. No, thank you so much, Giselle. I really appreciate the opportunity to be on the podcast. And I also want to give you flowers because um, I, I realize I don't know a lot of other Congolese American women attorneys. And so I'm so happy to be on the podcast with you. My older sister is another one, but it's again, great to be in, in your company. And I know before we start, I'm just going to make this caveat that I'm speaking on in my personal capacity and that whatever I share are not the views of the U.S. government or the Department of Defense. So again, thank you so much again, Giselle, for the invitation. Of course, of course, your sister, she must be just as amazing. Um, so I know that you grew up in um in germany right you're born to congolese parents and then you were raised in luxembourg and i'm just curious to kind of know what your experience um growing up was like and then kind of emigrating to the united states yeah so i was born in germany where my mom and dad they went there for their undergraduate and professional school opportunities so my dad got a scholarship to study in Germany from the European economic community. So it pre that is the predecessor of the European Union. And okay. there was a Catholic priest that saw a lot of promise in my dad. And um, so my dad went and applied for the scholarship and he got it. And he said he wanted to be an engineer. And, they, and he asked, where's the best place to be an engineer? And they said, Germany. And he was like, okay, well then I'm going there. So my dad went to Germany when he was 19 years old, didn't know any German. So he had to do language immersion and um, he, and he did very well. He ended up getting a PhD from the technical university of Aachen. And so that's where I was, my older sister and I were born. And then my mom joined him also getting a scholarship through the Catholic church um, to study microbiology. So my older sister and I were born in Aachen. And then when I was six months old, my dad got a job with General Motors and General Motors had a tech center in the small country of Luxembourg. And Luxembourg is a small country between Germany, France, and Belgium. Right. And it's about the size of Rhode Island. <laughs> and the population is little over half a million. So we grew up there till I was nine years old. And then General Motors is the reason why we moved to Michigan, which is home base. So in in the States. So I grew up outside of Detroit. And so people always ask me if I was a military kid, cause they hear that I was born in Germany. Right. And then I tell them, I'm like, no, I'm actually Congolese American and I'm a GM kid. So I'm a General Motors kid. And that is actually how we emigrated to the United States. Okay. So I know that you're currently multilingual, but coming to the States, did you speak English at all at that point? 
no. So I did not know how to speak English. So I learned English when we moved here. So I was, I was nine. Um, so that was the only time my mom let us watch a lot of TV and listen to a lot of music. So that was, so we moved in 1997. So that was the year of like men in black, Mariah Carey's honey. So th those are my memories of coming to America. Okay. Also, um, you know, so that was definitely that, but actually, yeah. So actually German and French and Luxembourgish were the languages that I spoke growing up in, in Luxembourg. And then, yeah, we had to learn English here. So a lot of, it surprises a lot of people that English is actually the fourth language that I learned. Right, right. Because I, I also have vivid memories of like when we were, I, I was actually born in the Congo. So coming over, I remember this guy that worked for our family was like, when you get to America, all of the streets are paved in gold and everything costs nine ninety nine, right? <laughs> so when we flew, when we came to the States, we went to New York and to the Bronx. So obviously mm -hmm. no streets paved in gold, but um, <laughs> and similar to you, learn English watching TV. Um, so what was that? Do you remember that transition, what you were feeling like coming to this new space and, you know, like um, not only from the cultural perspective, but just being a kid and this new world, what did that feel yeah. like for you? No, it was really interesting because again, I grew up in Europe as a black child. Mm -hmm. um, and so having, so that was also a very unique experience. And usually like I, we lived in a village where there were not a lot of other um, black people. So actually in, in Luxembourg, the largest black community are actually Cape Verdeans. So, oh, okay. so there are a couple of Cape Verdean kids in my elementary school, but generally speaking, uh, Luxembourg is not as diverse. So I would spend a lot of weekends in Brussels because as you know, in a, a lot of Congolese live yes. in Brussels. So we go to Matongue, uh, the, the Congolese neighborhood in, mm -hmm. in Brussels. Uh, and also go to Paris a lot because a lot of our family also is in France. And, and then we would visit Germany. So I always kind of uh, grew it up in a very multicultural, diverse uh, environment. I mean, my parents, again, like they're, again, Congo was always in the house, Congolese culture, Congolese food. And also, again, like I mentioned that there are a lot of Congolese in Belgium or France. I had that connection as well. But then mm -hmm. the interesting thing was, especially growing up in Europe is we watched a lot of American television. And so I, it was great to watch American televisions because I did get to see black lawyers or black doctors, even if it was fictional, mm -hmm. we did watch like Fresh Prince and the Cosby show. And so it was really nice to watch American television because it was, I was able to see black achievement in Europe. A lot of black Europeans are, more so exposed to going into the arts or sports, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. didn't see like black judges or anything like that. So my dad always loved, um, you know, talk, talk about Colin Powell or, um, you know, other folks that had achieved a lot in, or, or Oprah, you know, we would watch Oprah, but dubbed in, you know, German or, or, in, or watch it, you know, it was subtitles, but it was really cool to have grown up in Europe in the nineties and see, mm -hmm all these successful black folks in, um, yeah, on, on television, even my older sister, she actually said like seeing Johnny Cochran during the OJ trial, even though we were in Luxembourg was really yeah. cool to see black lawyers. And so coming to America when, um, you know, as a child, it was really cool to see, especially minorities in positions of power and influence because, because of Europe and of course the legacy of colonialism um, in Europe, you don't really see a lot of people of color mm -hmm. in positions of power. That has now changed where you see more politicians who have an immigrant background, but that was not the norm growing up. Well, you are certainly um, someone who took on the, the legacy of your own parents in terms of their uh, academic achievements. Um, you graduated from the University of Michigan, a top 25 school. That's your Jewish doctorate from the University of Michigan Law School, a top 10 law school. So where did the focus of high academic achievement come from? Was it your parents? No, definitely. Um, Cause both of my parents have PhDs. So it's cool to have two doctor coupes. <laughs> so, um, and also real, and also seeing how hard it is to get a PhD that takes mm -hmm. a lot of dedication and, and my mom actually got her PhD after having us. So we're wow. five kids. And wow. by the time, so we were four kids when she um, defended her dissertation. So of course she had to take some breaks 
in between because she had children, but right, right. it was really cool that, you know, my mom and dad have supported each other in getting their doctorates. So my dad always encouraged my mom to finish even after having the four of us and then the youngest came after. Um, so I think definitely having seen that and also seeing the people from my parents' generation for those that did leave Congo to go study in Europe or the United States. Even one of my dad's friends studied in Japan and mm. how they you know, they said, well, that was the oppor- those, those opportunities were available to get educational advancement. And also hearing how hard their stories were, you know, in the 70s and 80s, moving, mm-hmm. leaving their families behind. Um, like I, I sometimes I can't believe, I'm very, I admire them strongly because my dad was 19 when he left and just started over. So, um, but I think definitely I had, I had that around me and that was very inspiring. Okay. Awesome. Um, cause as you know, a lot of people don't, um, you know, there's some years between us. So I'm of the previous generation, I think where you definitely saw the Congolese, um, education has always been at the forefront, but I'm part of the community where like my grandmother had, a fourth, fifth grade education. She got married very, very young. My mom got married at 18 and then, you know, went back to school later on to get a nursing degree. So me becoming a lawyer was not, you know, I didn't have like the people around me that I saw. My father was just very driven and very education focused. So it's, yeah. it's a great thing that you had around you for sure. And, we, and I share that as well. My grandmothers had the similar level of, of education. So, um, yeah, I think it was just pe- people saw a lot in my dad and my mom mm-hmm. and invested in them. I think it was definitely the the Catholic education system and that there were mm-hmm. priests and nuns that saw that promise. But we share that as well. My grandmothers couldn't read as well. So again, yeah. kudos to our, you know, we are definitely our ancestors. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so you told me that your sister watching Johnny Cochran and um, <laughs> the trial kind of, you know, motivated her um, to become a lawyer. What was your motivation to earn your doc, uh, your Juris Doctorate? I mean, I think the same with me. Uh, my my older sister, Carla, is one of my heroes. So, And she's seven years older than me. So I always thought Carla was super cool. So I hope, I, mean, I know Carla will see this, but she was <laughs> definitely uh, a source of inspiration. But also, um, in addition to, of course, my dad exposing us to different role models, I think, I've always had an interest in social justice. So, you know, Nelson Mandela was a lawyer and, you know, so were other um, activists and folks that I admired. So I naturally was inclined to, to go to law school because of that as well. Okay. So now you are this phenomenal, accomplished woman in this space. You are working in the um, Biden-Harris administration. You have um, experience advising senior U.S. government officials, implementing national security policies, spanning the European Union, the five eyes, which are Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and United Kingdom, and Africa. So how do you go from lawyer, and I don't know if you've practiced, you can tell me a little bit about that, to transitioning into this field? Yeah, so I was always one of those rebels, Giselle, I, mm. I will open, I'll be honest about that. So even when I went to law school, I was like, mm, I don't know if I like criminal law and all that, but my older sister, she loves that stuff. So my sister did like, um, like move court, all of that. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, but I, I was all, I kind of always knew I liked the international law, human rights, um, path. But then also the thing is, a lot of law schools actually, I don't think, know how to guide people career-wise if people Ooh. have that interest. So I've okay. always had to be very entrepreneurial because I think with law schools, of course, it's easier if you go you know, to a firm or if yeah. you work, you know, go to a public defender. They're very niche. I mean, if, if, you are, if, you, if you decide to go down those tracks, there is definitely a blueprint or a path that you could follow. Right. But... I always kind of knew I didn't want to necessarily practice and be kind of non-traditional. So for example, like my second year of law school, I actually interned for a lobbying firm or or public affairs firm because actually there was an alum of my law school. Her name is Elena Beverly, who was there. 
And um, and I found Elena because I was the so also our Black Law Students Alliance always had an annual scholarship banquet, and um, and one of the big scholarship awards uh, would go towards three Balsa students that wanted to foster economic change upon leaving law school. Okay. I was one of those recipients my 1L year. And then, of course, if you're one of the winners, you got to organize the next banquet. So <laughs> and I was looking for, um, you know, I, 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 my idea was as being the lead for be, leading the banquet the, the following year was to have a previous scholarship recipient actually come back to talk about how maybe the scholarship impacted them and their career. Mm -hmm. And Elena Beverly um, had been in in the White House and the Domestic Policy Council and now had transitioned to lobbying and and then looked through the bios of the other principals and consultants at the lobbying firm. And a lot of them were actually former lawyers that actually worked on Capitol Hill before or worked for advocacy orgs or, of course, worked in the executive branch. And then I realized, I'm like, hey, I actually want to do more of that. Sounds like mm-hmm. there there is a legal aspect, but there's policy, but also like a communications in, um, aspect. And so actually it was through the Raven Group that I also learned once I came to DC, the importance of networking. So I kind of mm-hmm. learned early, go grab coffees, things like that. And I realized that that actually has been one of the best tools or gifts that I got learning um, or or in terms of something that I was exposed to at an earlier age, because also I went to law school straight from undergrad. Okay. So I had to cultivate those networks. Um, And so also a lot of their clients were high level or high profile folks in in the Obama administration. So actually it was my network in the, through the Raven group that also helped me once I was done with law school to do an, an unpaid fellowship on Capitol Hill. And then they were also helped facilitate my resume being shown to people in the Obama administration. And then that once I interviewed, I thankfully I, I was given the opportunity to, um, to be part of the Obama administration. But if anything, they exposed me again, the importance of networking, mm-hmm, of course mm-hmm. doing also good work because networking is not enough. You also have to provide results to highlight that you are a good hire. But I I think because of having been exposed to the Raven group and also seeing the attorneys there that kind of, yeah, that they went through a more non-traditional path. It kind of gave me the courage to, to do the same. So after law school, I went to Capitol Hill and um, worked in the first on the house judiciary committee, uh, which was then led by John Conyers of Detroit. And then I was a fellow for Congresswoman Karen Bass, who is now the mayor of Los Angeles. Yes, and then yes. after that, I got to work in the Obama administration. Wow. So, you know, it's such an important thing that you mentioned in terms of networking, because, you know, it is a, um, a tool that is just very valuable. But a lot of us, a lot of people don't know how to network. Um, is there something that you think within your personality that lend itself to doing that and being successful at that? Or was it something that you were actually taught, a skill set that you learned um, to utilize? I think it's a combination of both. I think probably as someone like yourself, as someone who moves between cultures or communities, you just kind of notice that, hey, knowing how to connect with people, especially in terms of ways that they're more comfortable with or verbiage they're comfortable with, I think that just teaches you to move to learn to adapt talking to different audiences. And then I think also having grown up in an environment that is multilingual, Mm -hmm. I think moving around and talking to people and trying to connect with them is not completely foreign to me, but I tell people I'm an extroverted introvert. (laughs) (laughs) I am introverted. But I think also having seen my parents do that too, see them networking, I, I think that has helped as well. But I think now it's definitely become more of a muscle. Now, Mm -hmm. for example, if there are individuals that I feel very connected to, I make sure to check in with them regularly. And it doesn't have to be all the time. Mm -hmm. It could be every couple months um, just to let them know, hey, just want to let you know I'm up to this. Um, Would love to hear about what you're doing. Let's catch up. Or even just saying, hey, you were on my mind. How are you and your family? So it is something um, that I've definitely done more intentionally, but I think 
having grown up in the environments that I have been in, it, it has probably come a little bit more natural um, compared to others. So I do recognize that because I know that some people are more shy, but I always tell folks too, if you talk about things that you're passionate about or something that you really connected with someone about, then there should be, hopefully that connection should be easier and f- not feel as forced. Yeah, because I, I think that the struggle for a lot of people is that it, beca- it as- appears very transactional and maybe lacks that intentionality that you talked about and maybe a level of, of authenticity. So it's like, well, the person that you're looking to uh, network with kind of, you know, it's, it becomes a one and done because of right. maybe someone is not skilled in the way that they've approached it. So you get to the point of um, your resume is passed around, right? So in rooms that you're not sitting in I, and because you've done good work, because you've networked well. Um, how is, so how do you then go from um, that last point where you're kind of exposed to the Obama administration to now having the opportunity to work in this current administration? Yeah, no, I think the biggest thing for me was, you know, once I did get the opportunity to work at DHS and I got to work on European affairs because I definitely was one of those being like, I just want to walk or work, work on foreign policy, national security. And so I did that, but then it's like the, well, now what, right? Mm-hmm. And so I, I've just been really focused on getting different kinds of experiences to make sure that, you know, God willing, I will be in senior roles in the future that I have, I have the experiences to draw upon to be a good leader, especially like in the time right now, in the world, we're experiencing a lot of crisis and Mm -hmm. volatility. Mm -hmm. So I know, for example, uh, so for example, right after the Obama administration, I went to a think tank, so a research institution, the RAND Corporation, and they do a lot of national security research. And by being at the RAND Corporation, I actually was around a lot of people who had PhDs. And so it was really interesting to see their thinking in terms of how they looked at problems. I also got to, or problems or challenges. And I also got to work on projects that allowed me to get exposure to how the State Department works and the Department of Defense, because at that time, I'd only been at the Department of Homeland Security. So it was also really cool to work on projects to see how different agencies approach different problem sets. Mm -hmm. And then I was, and after I was at the Rand Corporation for about two years, actually went back to Capitol Hill. So I was counsel on the House Homeland Security Committee where I worked on transportation and maritime security for the then chairman, Benny Thompson, who was the chairman of the House Homeland Security Committee and also was the chair of the January 6th commission after I had Mm -hmm. left. Um, So I think it was also good for me to get that legislative experience to understand Mm -hmm. how, you know, members of Congress look at these issues or also how, what Congress's role can be in talking, in addressing or, or having conversations around national security or homeland security issues. And I wanted to, of course, it was very advantageous that President Biden won because then I also was in consideration for roles in his administration. And I actually wanted to go to the Department of Defense to get another experience, you know, again, to, mm. as of right now, before then, definitely had more of a homeland security background. But now having been at the Department of Defense for two years, that has definitely helped mold me and grow me tremendously because it is the, you know, it is the world's largest bureaucracy. It employs, it's one of, actually, I think it's are the world's largest employer, or at least the U S in the U S is one of the Uh largest employers. So that's been very eye opening just to see such a massive organization with so many, with critical missions. And I started out in the deputy secretary of defense, Dr. Mm -hmm. Kathleen Hicks's office, and she's the first woman deputy secretary of defense. So it's been definitely an honor to have worked under a, a trailblazer, herself. Um, so I think it's just absorbing being at DOD right now and, and being there to pitch in given the many challenges that are happening right now. So um, I have no doubt that you'll get to that senior leadership position that you are striving for. Um, so tell me about just the kind of, um, I made the assumption and I talked about that at the beginning of the opening that maybe there aren't a lot of black faces or a lot of women in the, in, you know, 
where you are. You went mentioned this woman. I, I quickly forgot her name. I'm sorry. Um, that you're working under the first mm -hmm. woman who's a deputy mm -hmm. secretary deputy. Mm -hmm. of defense. Um, so how has it been navigating a space where you're not necessarily seeing people that look like you? Right. No, I mean, I, it definitely has its challenges. I think, I think as anyone can imagine, and as you, as we all probably can assume with dealing with defense or national security, it is a very male dominated field. And then, well, now, uh, well, former, well, I, her title is Ambassador Susan Rice, but mm -hmm. Susan Rice was also um, the National Security Advisor under President Obama, and now mm -hmm. she's the Director of the Domestic Policy Council. But she had described the State Department, which I think is applicable to the other national security agencies, as pale, male, and Yale, or something like that. Oh, That's, wow. that she has, okay. I'm using her words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So if anything, it is kind of, in terms of, yes, for folks who are not familiar with the space, that is how it's been described. And of course, we have, you know, had diversity, especially in this administration at the higher level. So the Secretary of Defense, Lloyd mm -hmm. Austin, is an mm -hmm. African-American black I follow man. on Twitter. <laughs> great. Awesome. And then Dr. Hicks, uh, Dr. Kathleen Hicks, the Deputy Secretary. And then we have Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield, who's an African-American woman who's the mm. ambassador to the UN. One of my mentors, um, Ambassador Bonnie Jenkins, she's the Undersecretary for Arms Control and International Security at Department of State. So I think we definitely have folks at the higher levels um, mm -hmm. that reflect that diversity. But I think like with any sector, I think once you again look at the mid-level or junior roles, you know, I think you kind of, they're, they're, the data shows that there are more disparities. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think the other difficult um, reality about this field is that, again, usually you have to have a background in international security or um, or usually have to have means uh, to mm. do an internship that is unpaid at a think tank or be able to intern in DC or New York, but the cost of living is very high. So right. there are those very real economic barriers that tend to impact folks that are lower income or, you know, are from communities of color. And so I think there has to be more, yeah, I think introspection about that and how that can be a barrier. So I would mm -hmm. say the data shows it across Think Act reports. It's probably not as diverse as it should be or, or could be given how diverse our country is. And so I often am in the space in spaces where I am the only one that looks yeah. like me. Yeah. And I think, of course, that can make one feel lonely, but I'm mm -hmm. grateful that I have support a support system through organizations that I'm part of or my friends and family to, you know, keep going. And then as this podcast is focused on to make sure that I can help bring in some new talent as well. Awesome. Yeah, because I was going to ask you, how do you stay encouraged, right? Um, and motivated to elevate if you're not seeing, um, you know, people who look like you, but I think you're right. Support system, family, it doesn't necessarily have to come within uh, the organization itself. Um, yeah. So generally in terms of involvement in politics, um, I think if you took the temperature, some people, especially after the few years that we had prior to this administration have become maybe a little bit disillusioned about, you know, how politics actually operate and that, you know, the system is there to help the common person. Um, what would you say to someone who feels a little bit discouraged just in terms of the political process and how it works? Yeah, no, I mean, I think anyone who's definitely watched the news lately, I think can recognize it's been, we've been in for a ride, but I think the biggest thing for me is that civic engagement, because if you don't engage, then the people that you put in the office or are serving on your behalf, you know, in all parts of government, if you don't speak up or you don't get engaged, then they assume that you don't care. Mm -hmm. And so I think the biggest thing that I found so encouraging is seeing leaders, especially from the civil rights era, who were so young and I think challenged America to, to live up to what the constitution actually says. And yeah. Um, we are the beneficiaries of that. And especially seeing them now transition and realizing like, oh, 
John Lewis is gone, you know, or, or others, or, you know, Colin Powell passed away recently. It's like, those leaders are transitioning. Who's going to take up the mantle if right. we just sit there? Um, so that's definitely something um, that I thought about. And, and I think if people have frustrations, I think that's totally normal. So it's more so trying to figure out, well, what do you want to do with that? And again, it doesn't mean you have to run for office. It could be you starting you know, an organization locally focused on mentoring. I think the biggest thing is just, um, I think realizing that if people don't stand up or, or don't try to address some of these issues, then they will just continue. And I think, again, like I'd mentioned to you, that previous generation decided to speak up or, or take on these issues. But you, I think we're also realizing that there's no guarantee just because they started that, that that will continue. Right, unless there's engagement, um, right? Like kind of a new wave of people for sure. And I think um, it could be through the arts too, or sports. Like I, I always tell folks that it, it could be very, you know, whatever your strengths are. Right, so you don't have to enter the world of politics. You're saying mm -hmm. to be able to mm -hmm. have impact. Correct. Um, so you and I met through the Congolese Diaspora Summit, of which you are a founding member. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, I was going to do the Congolese chant that we do, but <laughs> I'm in place. <laughs> um, but I just want to know, to the extent that there has been some influence, how has your Congolese background influenced your foray into this space? Yeah, I mean, I think it's been a critical part, especially because I told you, like, I've always been interested in international affairs and especially when I was going coming up in undergrad and in law school, there was all this talk about conflict minerals and, uh, and the unfortunate realities of the sexual violence that was happening in Eastern Congo. Yeah. And I realized that a lot of the people that were speaking on it were actually not of Congolese heritage. Um, it was, um, you know, celebrities and, you know, it was it was people like celebrities. And I was like, well, no one who's actually from our community is wow. really talking that much um, about that. There's one um, scholar, Bemba Dizolele, who's here, at, he, who is now the head of the Africa program at a big think tank called CSIS. But besides like Bemba or others, especially in D.C., there weren't mm -hmm. really I didn't really see as many Congolese faces as there should be. Um, okay. speaking to DC audiences. And so one of the founding members, uh, Luko Kosomo, she was also working on Capitol Hill. So she was a Capitol, uh, she was also a staffer in Congress. And so we were kind of thinking about like, well, how could um, our perspectives, especially as Congolese Americans and, mm -hmm. and those of us who are more so millennials on down get to engage in this discussion, especially because We've seen folks in our community actually do service projects back mm -hmm. home, or um, or do or do or do service service projects, or start businesses back in in, in the Congo. So it's been yeah. interesting to to figure out well how could that be leveraged or also just be more be made visible, especially because I think there is that need uh, for that perspective to be heard, and so the. Congolese Diaspora Impact Summit was kind of born out of the desire to figure out how, especially how the U.S. US government or the U.S. can harness that talent uh, as well. So I think that that's been, that was the motivating factor. And then also the summit team has also been a good source, again, of mentorship, just mm -hmm. exposing younger Congolese American professionals um, to the fact that there are some of us who are working in government or business out there as well. So it's all, it served a, a dual purpose. Awesome. And it was a great time for me to connect with other Congolese people when I attended the event that you had. Um, so one of your focuses um, is that you are making sure or desirous of making sure that Black voices are heard in this national security space. Why is that specifically important to you? Well, I think it's important because the the reality is that the United States is a multicultural and multi-racial uh, democracy. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it is actually America's strength. So to me, it kind of seems like a no-brainer to ensure that the experiences of 
folks from those communities is also incorporated in the decision-making process in terms of how America shows up in the world. So, and I think as there's of course research that shows that even in the private sector, you want a diversity of thought and diversity of experiences. And that of course in the corporate setting, it's helped folks increase their bottom line. So it would make sense to also use that line of thinking as America makes decisions on the global stage, especially in an, in an environment that is always evolving. Right, 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 right. Okay, so you are a barrier breaker. You are, you know, again, in this space that's not really, um, you know, that's not known to a lot of people. And we want to maybe uh, expose young people to consider right? Career in government, career in the national security space. Have you cons- thought about what that could look like, a way to kind of engage the generation behind you to be able to, um, you talked about economic disparities being one of the barriers though. You talked about, um, you know, the opportunity to kind of do these internships, but um, it seems like, you know, because kids don't know, have never seen someone like you to think that it's a possibility, they couldn't even consider of this as a career. So what can we do? What can you do to be able to kind of um, present this as an opportunity, as a pathway for some young people? Yeah, so one thing that I have done is there are different organizations that are focused on reaching out to underrepresented uh, communities. So before coming into the administration, I was part of Women of Color Advancing Peace and Security, and it was founded by um, Ambassador Bonnie Jenkins, who I mentioned earlier. So she's currently at the State Department as an Undersecretary for Arms Control and International Security. And Ambassador Jenkins started the organization because she did realize that there wasn't necessarily that deep bench uh, or folks behind her um, mm-hmm. in the space. and. So I actually was a youth ambassador on that as as a part of WCAPS, where I did reach out to folks in colleges and high school to just talk about, you know, what my career path was like. And I also found an organization called Next Gen NatSec, which just highlighted and celebrated folks that were already in the space, um, especially more so folks that were at at the mid-level, mid-career level, just Mm -hmm. being like, hey, all these folks of color already are in the space and here are their bios there. Here are their beautiful faces. We made sure there were pictures of them and also just access to their LinkedIn or any websites that they had. So also just celebrating folks that are already in the space. Cause I think people kind of forget the retention piece. You also got to make sure you take care of the people that are already (laughs) in the space. (laughs) Um, so that was def- that was something that I got involved with, um, you know, prior to coming to the administration. And then there also there are already established organizations in the national security space. So one of them is the Truman National Security Project, which I'm a member of, and also the Truman National Security Project has done outreach um, to folks at colleges and universities. So I remember doing an event at Howard where we talked to students, uh, where I, I and, and other professionals of color talk to um, students at Howard about our roles and jobs in national security. So that that's definitely there as well. And then I'm also a term member on the Council on Foreign Relations. So of course, they're like those traditional organizations that exist and using whatever outreach mechanisms that they have, but also there are newer or more recent orgs like WCAPS that mm-hmm. also, touch, I think, have done a good job reaching out to the younger demographic. And I also want to give a kudos to Ambassador Jenkins, because when I first, well, well, when she founded WCAPS in 2017, she also organized a lot of panels around DC. And she actually was, she actually made me a moderator for one of those panels. And that was my first time ever moderating a panel. And I'm so glad she did that because I realized I enjoyed it and people thought that I was good at it. And I appreciate her giving me the chance to to do that um, and to show that I, I I could do it. So I think it's interesting that you, like that moderator thing is like, you're still kind of discovering pieces to yourself that you didn't even know that you you had. So what, um, how, how important is it for you to kind of stay in a state of evolution, not remaining stagnant? 
I think it's very important because I've realized a lot of things about myself. And I think especially having come out of law school where mm -hmm. I think they kind of, and I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but in law schools, like some people that like went to the law firm and they became a partner and you're like, okay, well, what about after that? Or what in between that, right? Like you didn't hear the whole story or people that did become criminal defense attorneys and and kind of being like, okay, and then af after that, what, you know? Right. And I think the interesting thing, um, especially having been in, the nice thing I like about DC is like people move and switch careers and move in and out all the time. So I do like that I live in a city where it's okay for people to switch their minds. And, and there are a lot of non-practicing attorneys too. So I'm, I'm in, in good company. Good company. <laughs> right. Um, but I think especially in the field that I'm in, with national security, it's always evolving and changing. So you always got to keep up about what the next threat is or, mm -hmm. you know, the next yeah. issue. So I do like the fact that this field forces you to always, you know, be up, you know, be, be ready, listen to what's going on in the street. So it's like, I read the news every day because things can change in a matter of minutes. But I, even for me, I've realized it's okay for my interests to change or realize that, Hey, I've been doing this for a minute, but I don't want to do that anymore. So I think, yeah, I'm, I'm realizing, like you said, I am accepting that that's actually quite normal, but I think when you maybe go to graduate school or law school, you think you're going to work on the same thing forever and be happy doing that. But I think I've learned very recently that it's okay to, to not know and accepting that. I love that. Um, so for just a lay person like myself, meaning non-political person, it was just, I mean, the experience of a lifetime um, that we got to see Vice President Harris elevate to that, you know, to the position that she has. How was it for you in the world of government to see this, um, this woman of color reach that pinnacle? No, I think it is incredibly inspiring and even you know, before that, having the opportunity to serve in the Obama administration as well, um, I think the ability to see that is is a gift because like I told you, having grown up in Europe as a Black person, you don't see that at all. So I think the fact that, you know, they and others um, give, you know, give you the opportunity to dream. I don't think people understand the value that that can have. And even seeing Dr. Hicks as well, um, you know, being in meetings and realizing like, oh, there's not a lot of women here, you know, you're just like, oh, wow. Like, so I think even just being able to see that um, is is important. So I know, like, especially the, the generation on down, they don't realize how spoiled they are. <laughs> At least having had, um, having seen that and having that be accepted as normal. So tell me, um, because I, I, I don't want to overstate the fact that you've you've attained this level of success you know by hard work obviously you know the education that you have the opportunities that you could vent you took advantage of but also because you're you right so there's something inherent to you innate to you um that makes you rise above um others so tell me what your superpower is hmm. i think my superpower and i think i give it to give it credence to my mom. I think it's like, I am an optimist and I know like things, the world is, is in a tough space. And I think also, as you know, um, you know, being Congolese American and knowing that not all parts of the world are rosy, but I think having that optimism and also realizing, you know, the world needs more light. And so mm -hmm. if you are not the light in the world, the world is dark. So I think that's what I, try to um, espouse to, you know, to be a light for others, because if we don't turn on the light, whatever your talent is or your purpose is, is then, you know, I think that would be a terrible tragedy. So I, even when times are hard, that's what I try to remind myself. Laura, you are a gem and a gift yourself. I'm so glad that we got to spend some time and get a kind of a sliver of understanding about the work that you do and the space that you're in. We know that you are going to be a trailblazer for that next generation to come. We're just Congolese proud of you, uh, expecting great things from you. So thank you so much for joining us on this podcast today. Thank you, Giselle. Thank you. Okay. Look forward to seeing you soon. Okay. Bye. Bye.